Good evening. I'm honored to be here tonight in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Baruch Hashem, see so many of you came. I already had another lecture now nearby here, but went well, Baruch Hashem. This lecture should be the Refuat Shlomo Rafael Ben Mazal, Atzlachat Shlomo Ben Miriam, Chana Roz Bat Luba, Atzlacha Bezivug, Leilu Nishmat, Saba, Emil, and the uh, well-being of uh, Pekarski family. Also, the Refuat Daniel Aaron Ben Ruth, and Dvora Elisheva Bat Sarah. And successful Shiduch and Refuat Shlema of Liora Bat Barno. And everybody else here that need Leilui Neshama or the Refuat Shlema as well, Bezrat Hashem. On Shabbat, we read about Parashat Yitro. We finally became a nation. היום הזה נהיית לעם. Today you became officially a nation. What nation? How do you say a nation in Hebrew? Goy. Goy. Goy means nations. Goy means a nation. Goy Kadosh, it's the Jewish nation, holy nation. What makes the Jewish nation holy? Their beautiful beards? The Indians who bow down to the cow also have beards. The piece of thing on their head, hats, what? Turbans? Muslim also have. Doesn't make you holy. The word holy, kadosh, kedusha, means separation from the rest of the world. Separation from the nations. I have to live in this world, what can I do? But I have nothing to do with this world, meaning what's happening in this world. I hate to see what the world is doing. I hate this liberalism. I hate the lack of modesty. I hate the fakeness. I hate the baseless hatred, the sinat chinam. I hate the materialism. I, I hate everything that Hashem hates. And I love everything that Hashem loves. The goal in life is to be like Hashem. Ma'u chanun, afata chanun, ma'u rachum, afata rachum, the Gemara say, I want you to be like me. How can I be like you? Obviously, you can't be like me 100%, but I want you to think like me. I want you to love what I love, and I want you to hate what I hate. If you look at the religious world today, 15 million Jews are in the world, 12 million of them completely disconnected from Hashem and from the Torah. Completely. Zero connection. We're lucky if they have mezuzah in their house. Just about it, that's it. Eat anywhere, marry anyone they want, speak whatever they want look at whatever they want no boundaries no discipline, nothing zero, zero connection to Judaism and to Hashem so bad that among the Goyim Muslims and Christians and others, you see more religion than these Jews some of the Goyim will not dare to do what they do in Israel they will be shocked even if they see an Israeli or an American Jew doing such a thing, Goim sends me emails. How can it be? I'm so ashamed. Me as a Goy, I'm so ashamed that there are Jews that do such thing. They have no zero connection to Hashem. So what we have left? About three million people. They have connection to the Torah. Some keep Shabbat, most keep Shabbat. They learn, they listen. They connected. If that's the case, explain to me an email that I got yesterday. I got an email from Israel about someone who started to listen to me about two years ago. And in Baruch Hashem became Baal Tshuva. Not strong enough yet, but this is the email he wrote to me. 
In Hebrew, I'll translate. Kvod Arav, I'm in a serious crisis. I'm in a serious crisis. I feel I want to kick everything out of the window, meaning the religion, and go back to be complete secular like I used to be most of my life. What made me like this? I watch now a show on television that someone sent him a clip from, that they took from one of the shows about a reporter in a very lefty channel that hates Torah very much in Israel. And they hate rabbis very much. And they hate religious people very much. And they hate God very much. Very much. They are allergic to anything smells like Jews. They're allergic. They are the biggest antisemite. What do they do? They choose people that look religious, but they're totally fake, wicked people. They have even a little bit here, you know, pretend that they are religious. And they put them to the shows to back up all the poison that they throw at the rabbis and at the Torah and at the yeshiva guys to back them up. It's, it's a much bigger impact. If this Haredi agree, it's much, much more convincing. Why they're doing it? Because they want to make sure that the rest of the Israelis will remain secular. That's their goal in life. So there is a Rasha Merusha that after every show he speaks against rabbis, make up lies about them, even about me, told two minutes of lies, I don't know where he got them from. Hamash, make up things, nothing, not one, of, one word that came out of his mouth was even close to the truth. Stop making up stories. And now he came out of the closet. <laughs> I would bury him in that closet for a million years if I could. <laughs> this rat came out of the closet I love boys. <sighs> so, wait, 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 wait. So, why is this guy sending me now an email that he wants to leave the religion? What's the connection? Just because you found another Rasha Merusha, so you want to leave the religion? The Torah said not to be gay, so what's the connection? Not because of that. From the comments of the people that many of them are religious, how they all told him that they are proud of him for revealing the fact that he's gay. For that, he wants to vomit. I'm dying. You don't know how angry I am. This is the face of the religious people. I was thinking to myself, it would happen in an Arabic country. Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, that someone that's considered to be Muslim, religious, supposedly, comes out on the TV and says that he loves boys, he's gay. How long do you think he will be alive after that announcement? Three minutes. Five minutes. Someone already from the studio would kill him. He didn't have to go out to the street because of the shame, they couldn't take the shame. If the people wouldn't kill him, his father and brothers would kill him that night. Why? Not that I justify killing, it's against the Torah to kill. Even if you have a mass murderer, you cannot kill him. Why? You need Sanhedrin. There's no Sanhedrin. Only Sanhedrin can execute people. Since we don't have a temple, 2,000 years, there's no executions. So if I go and kill a murderer, I'm guilty. But he's a murderer. The Torah says murderers have to be executed. But you are not Sanhedrin. So everyone that the Torah say must die for his sins, we, the religious people, or anyone else, does not have permission to execute them. That's the Torah say, Amarim Yad al Chavero. Nikra Rasha, afilu lo ikau. Someone who raised his hand to hit his friend, he did not hit him in the end. 
Just this act of raising the fist about to hit someone made you already wicked. That's what Hashem said in the Torah. ולרשע אמר השם, למה תכה רעך? On which רשע we are talking about? ברני סנדרס. He was about to hit Jack Schumer. Both of them are very liberal, lefties. They had a fight on the street. Their name in the past Gilgul was Datan and Aviram. They were the first two lefties. Two, two lefties in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu that made him a lot of problems were these two famous wicked, Datan and Aviram. Datan and Aviram. Moshe saw an Egyptian soldier is beating up a Jew and Moshe killed him before he will kill the Jew. If he would be today, Moshe would get six years in Israeli prison for killing the Arab Hamas terrorist that is about to kill the Jew. Why did you shoot him? Self-defense. He's about to kill my brother. No, you should have shot, shot in the air. Baruch Hashem, now we have a righty government. Things are changing. We're going to change a lot of things. Hopefully. Hopefully. It's, things are already being changed. We have only one problem, is Netanyahu. He's half and half, he's not righty. 50-50. He's holding us back. And I say to my friends in the government, I say, all of you are optimistic. Watch for him. He's going to ruin all the plans. Some of them already knew about it. Because he's worried what they're going to say about him. What the newspaper, the media, is worried. You have to, to be a leader, the last thing you care about what people say about you. You only have to care what's right. And go with Hashem. Hashem, I'm doing what's right to save the Jewish state. That's it. I succeed, thanks to you. I fail, it's on you. You deal with that. I'm sacrificing my personal life to save the nation. Get rid of the, the, the dirty, wicked Supreme Court that hates religion so much. Hate rabbis, hate Torah, hate yeshivot. Love Hamas, love gays, love everything Hashem hates. I will eliminate them. They won't be able to tell us what to do anymore. We do not need them, we have the Torah. Let them deal with murders and rapes and stealing. That's their job. Court has to deal with crime. Court cannot tell us political things. Courts cannot tell us what to do with our enemies. That's the leaders, the politicians have to decide. Just like here in America. You have a president and he chooses judges according to his ideology. If he's a Republican, he put conservative judges. And if he's a Democrat, he put gay judges to, to promote gay marriage. That's what Democrats like. But politician decides the rules based on who gets elected. But in Israel you can get elected and the Supreme Court holds you with a leash. There's nothing you can do. It's worthless. It's, you can have a government of 80 righties. 80. There's almost no left. But the few judges sit in the Supreme Court, hold you with your neck, and they make all the rules. Every time you want to pass a law, not legal, prejudiced, you can't do it, it's not logical, it's unacceptable. They kidnapped Israel. One of the things about I to be a kosher Jew, you must have Jewish ashkafa, Jewish ideology. It's the most important thing. To keep mitzvot, you learn how to keep the mitzvot with the ears. You have to fix your midot, your traits, your personality, and you have to fix your ashkafa. Now, today I would like to speak about a little bit on each one of the three categories that a person needs in order for him to be righteous. Who doesn't want to be a righteous person in the eyes of God? Here in this room, I believe every person that came here tonight, for sure, even though I don't know most of you, for sure would be very happy if he get a stamp 
on his head from Hashem, I love you, you're righteous, keep it up. Ah, we'll be dancing for months on the street. Why is he so happy? Don't ask. <laughs> Hashem told me he loved me. Such happiness. But there are three conditions for us to reach that level that Hashem would love us. First, we have to keep mitzvot. No one can be righteous if he's Mechalel Shabbat, obviously. Nobody can be righteous if he's a thief. Nobody can be righteous if he eats non-kosher food. This everybody understands. You don't need to be religious to know it. Even the Chilonim admit. I'm not religious, leave me alone. I don't keep mitzvot. I'm not plan pretending to be righteous. I'm not religious, leave me alone. Why? They know. In order for you to be righteous, you have to keep mitzvot. I don't keep mitzvot, I'm not righteous. End of story. Tov. All of you knew it. That's no secret here. Everybody that sits here knows in order for me to be righteous, I have to keep mitzvot. And if I make mistakes and some of the mitzvot I don't keep or I did not keep correctly, that's why Hashem gave us tshuva, repentance. That we do tshuva and we give tzedakah and we pray and we ask for forgiveness and Yom Kippur and we also get some suffering in life and that should be fixing all the horrible things we do. But overall, we keep mitzvot. We want to keep Torah and mitzvot. And we have to work on it. It's not easy. You can go up and down in life. Some people go up, 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 then they go down. So life, it's like a graph in a stock market. Go up, go down, go up. Life, you're not only going up. There are, there are crises in life. Sometimes you're away from your home, from your community. You were sent by, by, by work to, I don't know, China in the middle of nowhere, it's hard a little bit over there. You don't have Torah, you don't have your Chevruta. You're on the way down. Many Jews moved from New York to Miami, they went down 90%. The atmosphere in Miami is not the atmosphere of Monsi. There's nothing to compare. Monsi is a thousand times greater than Miami, spiritually. Maybe the life here is nice, hot weather, beaches, fancy cars. But that's exactly the way to attract a person away from the truth. Because people live in some kind of illusion that that's the life. But if you live in a place with 100,000 very religious people around you, and there's now one car on Shabbat, and everyone dress modest, and every block you have a yeshiva, and all the kids are holy, pure, religious kids, that makes a different impact on your life. Then you go to Tel Aviv or to other places with beaches, obviously it's much harder there. That's the truth. So the first category that we all know is to keep Torah and mitzvot. Now we're going into the second category. What's the second category? Improving our midot, our traits. Improving the midot, the bad midot. And the third category is the right Jewish ashkafa, the right Jewish ideology. In one sentence, soon I will elaborate, in one sentence, what is ashkafa? What's the meaning of this word? It means, in English, they translate it ideology. But what's the real translation of the word ashkafa? It, ashkafa equal. Everything Hashem love, I love. Everything He hates, I hate. That's a V in Ashkafa. If you're religious and you write this gay, I'm proud of you, be who you are, we are making you strong today after your announcement, you are Rasha Merusha. You're very wicked, even if you have a big yarmulke on your head. Why? Because Hashem hates this person very much and you love him. That means you hate Hashem. If you love Yasser Arafat, you are wicked, even if you never murdered anyone. If you love Hitler, you are wicked, even though you never killed a bug. You don't need to be a murderer to be Hitler. All you have to be is a supporter of him. 
Tell me who your friends and I tell you who you are. Tell me who your hero and I tell you who you are. So if you admire people that the Torah say that they are abomination in the eyes of Hashem and their actions is death penalty by stoning and an eternal cut for the soul in the afterlife. There's no worse punishment than that. And you run to tell a person like this, call a kavod, you're great, continue, get married to your boyfriend. I'm proud of you that you brought it out. You are rasha just as much as this rasha. No difference. And I, I, I feel terrible for a lot of people that think that they are religious, but their ashkafa is worse than Muslims. Muslims will not write to a gay in public on the internet, call a kavod, we're proud of you. They would be embarrassed to write such thing. If they would like to give him a compliment, they wouldn't write it in the comments with their names. They would write, on, in, or maybe on the phone, or maybe behind the scene, we're supporting you. But they will not dare to come like this with the yamaka. Kola kavod, great, you're great. That shows you that they have zero ashkafa, these people. They, have no, they, they don't have the right ashkafa. A kosher Jew admire Bachur Yeshiva. Someone that has the right ideology and you see Bachur Yeshiva walking in the street with Gemara, he has to feel that he wants to run and give him 500 kisses. Hug him, kiss his hand, kiss his head. Thank you for being uh, around here. Thank you for being in our environment. Thank you. Thanks to you we are alive. Thanks to your Torah, Hashem keeping us here. Look at Los Angeles. They had a lot of earthquakes. But Baruch Hashem, they started to open yeshivot and kolelim and a lot of bateknesset. Bli Ainara. 30 years vatishkot haaretz. The Torah saves the place. So, I don't want to jump to the third category yet. I would like to speak more about the second category, which is tikkun amidot. Let's make a list of all the bad traits that a person may have. Some of us have some of them. Some of us have all of them. The more bad midot we have, the harder we have to work to fix our life and become righteous. If we have one or two bad midot, it's not as hard as someone who has 20 bad midot. Someone that has 20 bad midot, he has to have a war in 20 different battles at the same time. Someone that has two bad midot has to have a war in two battles at the same time. It's not the same, 20 and, 20 and, and two. Let's make a list. What's the worst midah in life? The worst that Hashem hates the most, despite pride, gava. Gava is very, very bad. But gava is not the worst one alone. There is another very bad one. Ungratefulness does not have gratitude. Kfui. Tova. Kfui tova. Gets good and complain. People help him, he sticks a knife in their back. When they need help, he pretend he doesn't see. When they do for him, only complains. That's very common between husbands and wife. The wife does, 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 does. If she's lucky, she gets one compliment every 10 years. If she's a little bit more lucky, one compliment a year. How many things she did right until she got one compliment? Sometimes thousands. How many complaints she gets? And it's not even God there. That's fair. Adam Arishon was Kfui Tova, Chazal say. Hashem made him the most beautiful woman in the history of the world. She was not born from a woman. She was a direct design of the greatest artist. 
if ketchup on canvas is now a hundred million dollar, that some fool took ketchup and put three circles on a piece of ca uh, canvas, and the idiots here in this world fighting who is dumber than the other, and it went from 45 to a hundred million dollars. Ketchup on canvas, Google it. Ketchup on canvas, a hundred million dollars. Do you know how many years my yeshiva can run on a hundred million dollars? Thousand years. Thousand years of Torah. Ketchup on canvas. If ketchup on canvas is a hundred million dollar, Chava, that was designed by the best artist in history, beauty that never seen before. Imagine the prettiest woman in the world multiplied by a billion. Everybody next to her looked like a monkey, even Sarah. That was the prettiest woman ever lived. Compared to Chava, it's like comparing a person to a monkey. Imagine her beauty. Breathtaking. And what was the reaction of Adam? It's her fault. The woman you gave me, she convinced me to eat from the tree. If he was grateful, the last thing he would want is Hashem to be angry at Chava. Why, well, he may take her away from him. If you're smart, you defend her. He was your wife, right? No, no, God forbid. You do everything you can not to attract attention to it. Why did he do it? It's not my fault, it's her. Right away, humanity started with ungratefulness. So, Rabotai, the two worst one, Gava and ungratefulness. What's the next one? Anger. Anger. People are very angry. You have to see how people behave in the airport. On the flight today, in my flight, how the Goim fights with each other. I don't want to sit next to him. Excuse me, move me. Ah, ah. Like in the ground. She's playing her music. I'm trying to listen. Wow. If they had a gun, don't kill each other. No derech eretz, no nothing. Anger. Such anger in, in, in the world, people hunking. Go to Jerusalem, see what happened to you if you do not start to drive before it became green. Before it became green. You know, sometimes it becomes yellow. Yellow and then green. Just when he got yellow, 50 people. Ah, bah. And if you don't drive fast enough, the scooters, they bang on your car. Boom! Watch your eyes. Where are you going? People are exploding from anger. The Gemara says, Every person that is angry is equal to an idol worshiper. Even if it's justified? Even if it's justified, the anger. If it's not justified, it makes it a lot worse. What are you angry about? That's already a mental case. <laughs> One person walked in the street, and someone told him, Hey, Moshe, you know you're a very angry person? I'm not angry. I'm only angry when people make me angry. Baruch Hashem! If you walk in the street and look at the people and get angry, Nobody talks to your word and you get angry. You have to be hospitalized in a mental institution. If you get angry from nothing. So all the angry people, that means someone got them angry and it's justified. And that's a very big sin. Why? Because it's lack of emuna, No faith. You worry that he's the one who caused you the problem. But if you didn't deserve to suffer, Hashem would allow someone to make you suffer if you're innocent. So why you worry about him? It's like, like, like getting angry at the mailman. It, when someone sends you a check, you kiss the mailman or the one who sends you the check? <laughs> if now the mailman got you a, a lawsuit, someone is suing you, and he delivered the, the thing, you beat him up? Or you're angry at the person who sues you? You have to know who be, who's behind the scene. Don't be a dog. Dog, when you hit him with a, with a stick, he doesn't bite you, he bites the stick. 
If you throw the stick far away, the dog chase the stick, and for an hour is going to bark. Why? In his mind, the, the stick is his enemy. He doesn't understand that the one that hit him with the stick, that's his enemy, not the stick. But that's a dog. <laughs> Jealousy. That's a very common problem today. Even in the synagogues. Even in the communities. Even among religious communities. People are living in constant competition. What car they got, what car we'll get, how they did it, they changed, they renovated it. Why don't you do anything? She got a new ring, you're not buying me anything. They're going away for Pesach, why can't we go? All of that comes from stupidity. Stupidity. A person that is smart care what the other person has, how is it going to affect my life? Why do I care what kind of house he got or what kind of car he drives? How is it going to affect my life between me and Hashem? What, do, what reason in the world I have to be jealous with someone that Hashem decided to send him many millions of dollars? Problem number one, receiving a lot of money from Hashem is a very, very big risk. Very big risk. Because it's huge person, huge responsibility. What do you think? Hashem gave you a hundred million dollars because he loved your beautiful, shiny, bald head? That's not the reason. Or your beautiful eyes? Or because you're very tall or very short or fat or skinny? That's why Hashem gave you a hundred million dollars? Why did he give it to you? Let's see all the options. Option number one. Option number one, because he loves you. Option number two, because he hates you. How can it be? Same transaction, either he loves you or either he hates you. How is it possible? Same thing. Why you did it to me? Because I hate you. The next day, why you did it to me? Because I love you. Make up your mind. When you love me, you kiss me. When you hate me, you smack me. But when you give me a hundred million dollars, it has to be either you love me or you hate me. No, it can be both. If I love you, I give you a hundred million dollars to use 99 million of that to do wonderful things to improve your next world. Support yeshivot, support the shul, save souls, help the widows, help the orphan, put secular kids, move them into yeshiva spread a lot of Torah in the world, with your money, you're gonna gain billions of mitzvot every hour. Invested. Money brings mitzvot. I love you. I gave you a huge gift. Thanks to you, a million people can become Shomrei Shabbat if you invest your 100 million correctly. Your friend didn't get even half a million. He cannot save a million souls. But you have the power. Make sure you use the money with wisdom and responsibility. That's if I love you. How can it be I hate you so I give you a hundred million dollars? That's a very risk, very big risk. If you go to Parashat Vait Hanan, Sefer Dvarim, Deuteronomy, that's ten chapters. Before Parashat Ekev comes Parashat Vait Hanan. The last three verses of Parashat Vait Hanan teach us a very important foundation in life. People that Hashem hates, He pays them their reward in this world for the good things that they did to erase them and get rid of them because they're not going to go to the next world. They're going to lose their share to the world to come. God forbid. Lo alenu, lo alechem. Let me give you an example. There is a lefty liberal. Hates Torah, hates rabbi, hates yeshivot. All the time speak against religion, make fun of the rabbis, make fun of the rules of the Torah, copy the goyim, admire all the professors. That's his life. 
someone like that, can he ever do something good? Absolutely. He has mezuzot, most of them do. When he had three boys, did he make them brit milah? Yes, he brought the rabbi, the moel, and he did brit milah. Even though he's a lib, lib, he hates Torah. He makes fun of Torah. You ask, I sent a letter to Tommy Lapid, Zchutoy again alav. <laughs> took you a long time to get it. Many years ago, to explain how did he dare to circumcise his son Yair. Why? Because he said that he doesn't believe in Hashem, he doesn't believe in the Torah. Someone that says he doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in Torah, what right does he have to circumcise his baby? If he would cut the ear of the baby, he would go to 20 years in prison. So if he cut a different part in the body of his boy, should go to prison for 20 years. How will he justify the attack that he just attacked his baby? If the police come and arrest him, why are you arresting me? Attempted murder. Why? You just cut a part from your baby's body. Look how he's bleeding. Look how he's screaming. The child abuse. Lawyer alone will be $400,000. How is it possible that all these secular people circumcise their babies when they non-stop make fun of the Torah and say that it's nonsense? It's a big contradiction. They should have gone all to jail. In some countries, they will hang them. Some countries, if you attack a baby, they'll give you the electric chair. Maybe in Texas, I don't know. Especially if something goes wrong and he dies. Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho, what's going to happen to that father? How they agree to do Brit Mila? Good question. Of course, he never answered me because he doesn't have an answer. Why will he do Brit Mila? Top. So, one example is people do Brit Mila. Some of them put filin in a bar mitzvah for the pictures. It's not even theirs. The photographer has a pair of tefillin in his car. <laughs> Bar Mitzvah, what pictures are you going to take? <laughs> so he take him with the tefillin. Supposedly, it's pictures from the Bar Mitzvah. That one time that he put tefillin, that's a mitzvah. He get a reward for it. Few times in his life, he heard a bracha and answer amen. That's a mitzvah. Few times in his life, he ate kosher food. Maybe one time he participated in a Kiddush. Maybe in Pesach he eats Matzot. Maybe he gives donation to some people on the street, homeless. He feels bad for them, so he gives them some food or money. There is no such thing to find a secular Jew that does not have one mitzvah in his entire life. There's no such thing. Even the worst one on earth, I believe that even by Bernie Sanders, we will find one and a half mitzvot in eight years of his life. But one or two mitzvot maybe we'll find. So, how much will Hashem pay for that mitzvot? The mitzvot are endless reward. Since these people does not have a share to the world to come because they don't keep Shabbat, and they don't keep the Torah, and someone who's mechalel Shabbat, it's guaranteed in the Torah that his soul is cut for eternity and he doesn't have a share to the world to come, how will you pay a Mechalel Shabbat for all the good things he did in his life? The answer is, you make him buy in Florida 10 properties for 300,000, and three years later, it's worth a million each. He just made seven million, three years doing nothing. And he became a rich guy, like happened to a lot of secular Jews in New York, in Israel, in Florida, and in other places. How do you become rich? Hashem decides to make you very wealthy. Or, or you get saved from a horrible disease. Or you get, pretty to the, you get married to the prettiest woman in a, in, a, in a country. Or you had a dream to own a soccer team. So you, your bid won. Or a lot of the things you love, Hashem let you do it. He doesn't owe you anything. You drive a nice car, you enjoy your home, you enjoy your trips. This is what you are dreaming about. 
That's going to be your reward. But when you die, you get nothing. Therefore, משלם לרשע אל פניו לאבידו. לא יאחר לשלם לו אל פניו, אשלם לו לאבידו. To the wicked people, I do not delay the reward like I do with the righteous people. I pay them cash to their face to get rid of them. So if Hashem gave a person that is Mechalel Shabbat in his 60s a hundred million dollar in a big deal, that's the most miserable person in the world. That you know that Hashem paid him in this world because he doesn't want to give him anything in the eternal world. So you see, two people got the same amount of money. One is for his good and one is for his destruction. So therefore, when someone gets money, what are you jealous with? How do you know why Hashem is giving him his money? One option is, God forbid, Hashem wiped him out. He's in his blacklist. So he begins to pay him for all the good he did. You jealous with someone like that? Oh. Second, Rav, Rav Zilberstein, in his book, Alenu Leshabeach, he brings a story that one time he took a bus to Jerusalem, and there was a very, very long traffic jam. After almost an hour, he saw what's the reason. There was a fancy BMW 740 in Israel, it costs almost two and a half times more than here was smashed completely and five family members all died on the side of the road. Rav Zilberstein writes in his book, we can only imagine when this Jew went and bought such a fancy car in Israel and now everyone saw, wow, what a rich guy. It's a million shekel, this car. It's not, no, no joke, it's very expensive. So you need a mortgage for it. How many people were dying from jealousy when he bought that car? If any one of them would see that in one year this car will bury him and his wife and his three children, one person would be jealous with him? That this car is going to destroy him? That's where, that's where he's going to die, young, with his family? Anyone would be jealous with him? So you see that jealousy is stupid because you don't even know if what the person got is good. And you don't know, maybe your situation is a thousand times better than him. Sika microphone. Yitzhak, Sika microphone. So, jealousy, jealousy, is 100% based on ignorance and foolishness. I'll give you another example. A girl is not so pretty and she has a friend that is very pretty. So she's jealous with her every day. The friends, she likes her in one hand, but in her heart, every time she see when she dress up, she's eating her heart. Why couldn't I be as pretty as her? Is this a reason to be jealous or no? That's very foolish. Why Hashem made her pretty and you not so pretty? Very simple. She has a very hard test. To be extra pretty and to stay modest. When is it harder to be modest? When you have a lot to show or when you have nothing to show? That's a hundred times harder. You know these guys that goes to the gym for 10 years and they look, each hand looks like a watermelon, <laughs> six pack. And now you tell them, from now on, you are not allowed to walk in the beach with the cut t-shirt <laughs> for everyone to see the 20 years of hard work. How much this person is going to suffer? In, the rabbi told him, I forbid you from showing your six pack to any human being from now on. You have to dress with jackets, no one should see this. That's Tarbut Yavan, the culture of the Greeks. This person is eating his heart. Zaku Baruch. He's eating his heart. What did I work so hard for? For the show off. Now you took it away from me. 
I'll tell you a story. I once made a Georgian guy Baal Tshuva. This Georgian guy, the way I made him Baal Tshuva, it's very, very interesting. You know how sometimes things look like it's accidental? I had a different Georgian guy. I used to speak by the Georgian shul in Queens every Wednesday night. So one time the rabbi of the shul gives me an envelope. He said, one of the people here became Shomer Shabbat with his wife. He donated to you a thousand dollars as a gratitude. Back then it was a lot of money, a thousand dollars. Not like today. <laughs> today you cannot buy paper pa plates for a thousand dollars. Back then it still had, it's about 18 years ago. Okay. So, and he also wants to take you out to dinner because he have a lot of questions and, and his wife personal questions. I said, tell them next Wednesday when I come to the lecture, I'll, me, I'll come an hour earlier. You can see it, eat something and then go to the lecture. The next Wednesday when I came, he did not come with his wife. He came with his friend, another Georgian guy. He brought somebody else and that somebody was sitting together with me and him, three of us. We talk about the Torah and all that. And then we went to the lecture and he heard for the first time in his life a lecture for two hours and he came to me after the lectures with tears and gave me two checks. And until that time, it's very interesting, I was already giving lectures for years and nobody ever gave me a nice check. It was all peanuts. All of a sudden, this guy gives me a check. I said, no, I'm sorry, I cannot accept it. I don't know him. I told him maybe he's a mafia guy. I see he has a Porsche. He has an expensive watch. You don't know, a young guy like this, already so rich. He gives me a check. How much was the check back then? $7,000. And this was 10 days before I was almost closing my yeshiva. It was after September 11. All the donations stopped. I have 10 days, 10 days to get $15,000 if not the yeshiva is finished. I owe from last month and I have 10 days for the next payment. And if I'm not going to get the money, I don't know what. And I'm not a collector. I never collect money in my lectures, so I don't know what to do. This guy come to me in a Georgian shul. I want to do something for you. I never got so excited in my life. Give me a check for $7,000. I see the amount. I got scared. I said to him, no, I'm sorry, I can't accept it. No, no, I can't take it. He said, what? You're insulting me. You know, Georgians are the most generous people in the world. You should know that. <laughs> the most generous. You never find one stingy Georgian on earth. Take my word for it. They'll give you their heart. Whatever you want, they'll give you. Georgians. So I said to him, no, no, I'm sorry, I can't accept it. He said, you're insulting me. Everyone, I give him a check, calls me now every day. I want to give you a check. You tell me you don't want to come? Wait a minute. He took his checkbook, wrote another check for 7,000. Now I'll double your amount. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it's too much of a miracle. It's exactly what the yeshiva needs. I said, do I have permission to refuse? Maybe it's, uh, that's this the way Hashem wants to save the yeshiva. But... That was not the important part. The important part that this person became religious. Became religious. And the, after about a year that he was already Shomer Mitzvot, I wanted to set him up with the Baalat Tshuva girl. Where is she from? Monsi. She was modern, is modern. This guy brought some kind of a drink from France to America. In one year, he sold it for $60 million. Back then, it was like $200 million today. Became very rich. So he has, back then, he had a, the most expensive Mercedes in the world. Very expensive car. One time, he drove me on that car. He pressed the gas. I felt that my head is detaching from my neck. <laughs> Boom, went up. My yarmulke flew all the way to the windshield. So now he comes with this to the date. He first come to me. His car parked in my, car, in my driveway. I say to him, I don't want you to go to the date with your car. Take my car. I have a lousy Kia. <laughs> Barely driving. <laughs> I say to him, I don't, I don't want you. I don't want you to take your car to the date. 
I don't want the girl to marry your car. I want her to marry you. So please take my car. What do you care? First three dates, you leave your car in my driveway, take my car to the date. He didn't want. He's fighting. I said, oh, it's for your own good. What do you care? You got two hours. I'm here. Nobody is going to drive your car. <laughs> he insists to go with the car. Why? He wants to impress her that he's rich. <laughs> Why? This is stupid. What is this need that a person has to show off that he's successful? Who exactly you are impressing? That's pure stupidity. This competition between cousins and friends and people in the community create massive amount of Lashonara. And someone that speaks Lashonara, it's like a murder. It's like the three war sins in the Torah, Gilui Arayot, Shfichut Damim, Vavod Azara. What creates the Lashonara? Jealousy. If you're not jealous, someone you love and you're not jealous with, you speak Lashonara about them? No. You only speak Lashonara about someone that you're jealous with or someone that gets you angry. Because you cannot tolerate that other people like him and do things together with him. So you want to separate between him and his friends. That's what Lashon Hara does. That's why the punishment of Lashon Hara is leprosy. That, nobody can be near you. You have to be isolated, measure for measure. You want to isolate a person from his friends, we will isolate you from the nation. It's all measure for measure. So Rabotai, Sometimes you go to places inside the community. You see how everyone compares himself to everyone around. It's such a childish behaving. Every person Hashem gives him what he has. And it's a very big responsibility to be rich. The wealthier you are, the more dangerous your future is. Because most wealthy people do not even give 10% of what Hashem expects them to give to charity. The Gemara asks, what's better, to be rich, to be poor, or to be average? The Gemara, it's a, it's a philosophical, philosophical question in the Gemara. If you had to choose, you have three buttons, green, red, and orange. Green, rich, red, poor, Orange, average, barely paying the bill, but surviving average. with no debt. Four. Which one of the three you would choose? Average. Most people, with no hesitation, would grab the green. <laughs> Do you know one person in, on earth that will press the red? The Gemara say, better not to be rich, and better not to be poor. Better to be average. So the best blessing is to be someone that pays the bill and have zero savings. Why? First of all, you're counting on Hashem every day. You live with Emuna. You pray for tomorrow. You're always needy. When you are a needy, you behave very nice to your master. Why? I depend on him if I'll eat tomorrow or not. If you have a hundred million dollar laying, I'm okay. But when you don't know if you get Hashem upset, who knows what's going to happen next week. That's very good. Why? It's always a, a wake-up call. This is the words of Chazal. Better to be average. So now, all average people I know are jealous with the rich. Because they don't believe in the Torah. That's it, conclusion. If you believe in the Torah, why are you jealous with the rich? The answer is, because you don't believe in the Torah. The answer is, not exactly. How can you say he doesn't believe in the Torah? It's Shomer Shabbat, she's dressed modest. What do you mean she doesn't believe in the Torah? She's jealous. The answer is, yes, you believe in the Torah, you know to jealous is bad, but you have bad midot. You came to the world with this problem. Why did Hashem put you over here to get rid of this problem? Work on yourself. Stingy people 
have to practice to become generous. How you become generous? Some people are extremely cheap, extremely, beyond words. I met few like this. <laughs> they just cannot give even five dollars, nothing, nothing. They can't, it's just, you're gonna see if, if you grab it from them, they'll cry a week. <laughs> Ma, Moshe, what happened? I gave the rabbi $18. <laughs> Such a greedy rabbi. <laughs> he only comes for the money. <laughs> what, how someone like that become generous? Who can tell me the trick? Now I'm going to teach you a big trick. Hashem taught us in the Torah that you can be anyone you want to be in one condition. You have to act consistently. After the actions, follows the heart. So I give you an example. When I was in the army, in the Air Force, I was in a very, very special unit. Literally, half of Israel security was in the end of me and my few friends. No exaggeration. If there is a siren, doesn't matter when, middle of the night, we do a sleep with shoes, with uniform, cannot take off your shoes. We have to jump from the window on a pole, slide down, run to the planes, take out all the pins, the cover of the missiles, the pilot arrives, we tie him, we get the plane out, we are under the ground. In less than 60 seconds, the plane must be in the air. Because Israel is so tiny that if you, if you miss by a minute, it, it can be 10,000 dead if the, uh, the planes of the enemy uh, penetrate Israel. How do they call it? Datak Yerut. Yerut means we are always on alert. So because we are on alert, we cannot go to the dining room, like all the other soldiers in the base. So we have our own kitchen. How, what do you expect from a 19, 20 years old Israeli boys? They have to cook for themselves. It's not America, they're gonna bring you a chef. It's Israel. What do they do? Every morning the truck comes, throw 50, 50 loaves of bread, tomatoes, cucumbers, potatoes, and lots of eggplants. <laughs> eggplants is the diamond of the... And we had a guy, Alava Shalom, he passed from cancer. He was a friend of mine in the army, Ofer Levy. May this year will be for his Ilui Neshama. He was the chef. He used to cut the eggplants and make them in all kinds of forms. Problem with me, I could not stand eggplants. And every day the meal is eggplants, eggplants, eggplants. After seeing everyone licking their fingers and I'm the only one starving there, I decided to try eggplants. So I closed my nose. I ate it, I almost vomit. Why did I eat, why did I hate eggplants? There are three things I hate very much at that time. Eggplants, milk, and liver. Do you think it's coincidence? No. Those three things are unique. When I was a child, Every time before I went to school, my mother forced me to drink a glass of milk because she saw in a commercial <laughs> that milk is healthy. <laughs> you have to drink. No, don't do this to me. Drink and then go. <coughs> and I hated it so much, especially when she used to eat it and on top of it you had that thing. Oy. <laughs> Once I became independent, I never ever touched a glass of milk. Or she would force me to eat liver. You know how the chicken have little liver? Open, open, <laughs> I ate it, it's healthy. I can look at liver. What about eggplants? 
airplane, she didn't force me to eat. But I saw how she's burning them on the fire. And it looks like boogies, you know, does like... Nazel it. Out, all these strings like that. <laughs> it's so terrible. So I couldn't look at eggplants. Now I'm in the army. What's to eat? Eggplants. So I started to eat these eggplants. Then a little more, a little more. Today you come to my house for Shabbat, minimum 10 salads, eggplants. This kind, that kind, Bukharian style, Persian style, Israeli style. We can live without eggplants. All day eggplants. Why? Hashem made the world in such a way that you can reprogram yourself. After the actions, follows the heart. So if you're very cheap, I'm giving you now the secret. Every day when you come to shul, you put a quarter in a box. Quarter, even a very cheap guy can give without dying. It will hurt a little bit, I only put one quarter. After one week that you got used to give quarter, quarter, it doesn't excite you anymore, raise it to two quarters. So you'll have the same pain like the first week, because it's an, for the first quarter you got used to. S second quarter, that's really what's hurt. So you give 50 cents. Third week, 75. Fourth week, a dollar a week. A dollar a day. You give a dollar a day. Slowly, slowly, you add. A little more, a little more, a little more, until if the guy with the pushka box skipped you, you run after him. Hey, why are you skipping me? You get used to it. Once you get used to it, you got rid of one problem. How do you solve your ego issues? Ego. Life is full of ego. Most of the fights in your life is all comes from ego. Person that is humble, who exactly is going to fight with? Person that is down to earth, consider himself nothing. What reason he has to fight with anyone? They didn't put you to sit in the right place. Who am I? They didn't give you the best gift. Who am I? They didn't give you Aliyah and Shabbat. Who am I? Everything, I don't deserve anything. I don't expect anything. I don't deserve anything. I'm nothing. I'm a piece of sand. There's nobody can ever hurt me. The more proud you are, the more you suffer. Kills you from inside. I remember I used to have a family member when there was a gathering, all the family gathered. He used to enjoy to sing. You know these people? You, you always have an uncle like this in the family. So now, now he decides that he wants to sing. It's always the same story. Now the, the adults, they give him a lot of respect. So, shh, 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 shh. He has to sing. But we, the children, ah, no, we have to sing now. Who cares about your songs? We used to make noise. Ah, you had to see how angry he used to get. Especially at me, if I would make noise when he sing, give me such an angry look, I started to get very scared of him. Why? It's all about show off. You're ruining my show. If a person is down to earth, I've been seeing on Abba Shaul in Yom Kippur, one guy was standing and another guy walked and he walked on his feet, on his foot. Step on his foot. The other guy say, "Ay, look where you're going." Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul came to him. He said to him, "I've seen a lot of people that do bad things, but to lie to Hashem on Yom Kippur in the middle of davening—that's already a little bit too much." Who, Rabbi? Who, who lied to Hashem on Yom Kippur? He say, "You." Well, I lied to Hashem, chas v'shalom. Didn't you just say in the end of Shemona Yisrael, Eloi, netzor l'shoni mera, u'sfatai midaber mirma, ma? U'lekalelai, nafshi tidom, v'nafshi ke'afar lakol tiyeh. You just told Hashem, 
I'm gonna be like sand, nothing. This guy stepped on you. I never saw sand getting angry if someone stepped over him. What you say, you have to mean it. I'm nothing. So Rabotai, Rav Ben Sion Abba Shaul told us a very interesting chidush. You have to get to a level that you can care less at all. You don't care. When people praise you, you don't feel any better. And when people criticize you, either one does not make any impact on you. When people curse you, wish you should die, you fanatic, you crazy, you lunatic. It's roses. Smells great. When people tell you you're the greatest, you're the smartest, no one is like you. Nothing. Garbage. Smell of a garbage. Does not affect you. You don't feel even a little bit higher than what you were before the compliment. A kol level avalim, shtuyot, what people say, for good or for bad. When someone criticizes you and they, they curse you and they do all these things, well, sometimes people tell me it's easy, say than done. How am I gonna? How am I not going to get angry when my cousin is doing this and this and that to me, or my partner, or my wife, or my husband? Usually, when two friends are fighting and they come to me and say, what should I do? He keep talking about me, he's doing this to me, is that? I ask them, let me ask you a question. When you walk in the street, close to someone's house and they have a dog, you know, beware of dog. What happens when you walk on the sidewalk next to the fence of a nice private home? What is the dog doing? <laughs> Jumping on a fence, running back and forth. Is ready to murder you. What are you doing? Walking. You didn't go to him, you hit him, you threw something at him. Imagine if you do that, then until tomorrow he's gonna bark. You only walked. And the dog is barking, barking, barking. He wants to tear you apart. Do you know a normal person that will go home and sit and cry to his wife, I have such a hard day, why Moshe? The dog so upset at me, insulted me like this. He wanted to kill me, I'm so offended, you know, it broke my heart. If someone like this would come home and say to his wife such thing, I think she would want to get yesterday. Moshe, I'm sorry, you need, you're not normal. Go, leave me alone, ma. You care about the dog? You're not normal. So I said, today, the Gemara said that the people in today's generation are like dogs. So what do you care? What do you care? Pnea dog, pnea kelev. From all the animals, the Chachamim said that before Mashiach would come, people will be dogs. Why they didn't say people will be pigs? Today there's a lot of chazirut. People want more, more, more money, honor, fame, power. They should have said that people will be pigs. Why they said they'll be dogs? I'll tell you the secret. If a pig come next to you and you take your hand and give him a smack to his face or a kick, what will happen? He turn around and go to the corner. What is he gonna do? What do you always do? Eat. Good therapy. <laughs> Eat. But he doesn't, he doesn't really get a, any attention to you. He gave him a smack, the pig went and ate. No problem. If you walk next to a dog, you didn't hit him. He wants to murder you. The Gemara said that before the Mashiach would come, the situation in the world would be that all the wicked people, and it's 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
two billion wicked. Continue. How many uh, Buddhists you have? Seven hundred, six, seven hundred million. All of them idol worshippers. How many Hindus? Close to a billion. In India alone you have more than 500 million people. So close to a billion idol worshippers. How many Muslims you have? Close to two billion. They are not idol worshippers, but many of them support murder. Either they murder with their hands or happy that their friends murder. Jews and Goyim in general. It's a lot of violence there. So m almost all the people in the world are wicked. Among our nation, 80% mechalelei Shabbat. So they're all wicked. From the three million, those who are Shomer Shabbat, there are some who speak Lashon Ara all day, they are wicked. Some that steals all day in the business from the Goyim, they are wicked. Some that are jealous and proud and ego and anger and, uh, and uh, treat their wife like garbage, so they are wicked. Some that are horrible parents, they abuse their children, so they are wicked. So how many righteous people you have? If we have a hundred thousand in the whole world, I will be dancing here in the, in the grass right here. If we have a hundred thousand righteous in the whole world. So a hundred thousand from eight billion is how, many, how much percentage wise? Who knows math here? You do the math. In America, to ask a question in math is a life risk. <laughs> it may take a week to get an answer. <laughs> so, most people are wicked. Most people are angry. Most people are disrespectful. Most people are ungrateful. They don't appreciate their parents. There are kids that their parents bought them a car before they turned 17. Do they appreciate it? They speak to them like garbage. Kid with appreciation, every day would kiss his father's feet for spending 50,000 on his car. They don't appreciate. You owe me. Everybody owes me. Do you know that in America some kids sue their parents? Why you brought me to the world and you don't give me everything I want? And they win, yeah, they win. Wow. What do you expect with a liberal Jewish judge? Of course they're gonna win. So far, any questions before I go to the third category? No questions. I'm so clear? Or are you afraid? I'm yeah. What are your thoughts on Nutere Carta? They live in Monsi. Complete lunatics. They're not normal. It's one thing that you are anti-Zionist, anti-wicked communist, anti-liberal Jews that are, that are the enemies of the Jewish religion. It's one thing you despise them, which is a mitzvah to despise these wicked people. But nowhere in the Torah it says that you have to run and hug the Hamas and Iran who kill Jewish children. So that shows you that there are sitra achra. Because if they would come, Rav Yoel Misatme was a very big tzaddik. He wrote his books. He was very holy, very, very devoted to Hashem. And everything he wrote about the Tzionim, he was right. He was 100% right. He already told us 70 years ago what's going to be in the, in the wicked state of Israel to the religion. And how many Jewish kids they will turn into Goim, Mechalelei Shabbat, with zero knowledge in Judaism. He warned us from that. But he never say to go and hug Iran or, or Hamas or the Nazis or, or Ritihilim in the grave of Arafat. If he would see one of his students do such a thing, he would throw him away from the community for life. What did he say? To go hug the, the, the Arabs who wants to kill us? Shtuyot. They, the reason they do it is because they get millions of dollars from them. When you're being bribed, you don't see anymore the truth. When you get, I'll give you an example. You know, one of the common problems today in the Jewish world, even among Baalei Tshuva, is the non-Jewish women. That's a pandemic. Many Jews, they meet non-Jewish girls in the places where they go. They fall, you know, fall in love with them. And after that, it's very difficult to separate them. Why? Because they receive from them physical bribe. When a person is being bribed, he is becoming blind. 
he cannot see the truth. Where does it say it? In the Torah. There is a verse in the Torah. The Torah says, Ki ha-shochad ye'aver enei chachamim v'yisalef divrei tzadikim. Translation. The bribe will make the eyes of the wise people blind. V'yisalef divrei tzadikim. And will modify, twist, the words of the righteous. Many people think, when they think about this verse, they don't understand the verse correctly. Most people. What does this verse really say? We need the Torah to tell us that if Reuven bribed the judge, so the judge will take his side against Shimon in a trial. For this we need Torah. Every fool knows it. Bribe will make people go against justice. Witnesses, prosecutors, judges, everybody knows. You don't need Torah for that. So what is Hashem telling us? What every fool knows? That's the Torah. God forbid. It's much, much, much deeper. The Torah doesn't say that the judge will lie knowing he's lying to save Reuven because Reuven gave him $100,000 last night. That's not what the Torah say. The Torah say that from the minute a person receives bribe, he cannot see the truth. Not that he see the truth and goes against it. He becomes blind. The truth is completely different in his eyes. I give you an example. There is a wicked person in the community that many people are very upset with his actions. And he himself is very much against that person. Until this person one time sent him a check for Yom Tov. He heard that he's poor. He sent him $5,000 for Pesach. From the minute he got the $5,000, what happened? He begins to defend the crook that everybody wants to kick out of the community. No, it's not fair. You're doing him wrong. You don't see. What do you mean? A week ago you said this and this. No, I didn't see the whole picture. Give him kafschot. What changed? Nothing changed. His pocket just got bribed. That's why when you go to court, the judge is always a liberal lefty. If you're known as a lefty, immediately he takes your side. Because you have something in common, that's bribe. If you're a religious fanatic rabbi, immediately he hates you. Why? We don't have a common ground. Doesn't matter, it's in the subconscious already. See, Haredi is allergic. He will find how to find him guilty. He see one of his friends from Tel Aviv, he'll do everything he can to let him go with a minor penalty. That's called Shochad Yaver. How do you know? I tell you something interesting. Take the judge that received the bribe from one of the people, take him to a light detector a minute after he ruled his verdict. Take him to a light detector. Do you think that Reuven, that you just say that he's not guilty, is really not guilty? He will answer with no hesitation, absolutely. He's innocent. And the machine will show that he's not lying. Because he's blinded. He's not lying. He cannot see fault to Reuven because Reuven gave him a big gift. Same thing your children. If you get a call from school, Mr. Cohen, yes, your son is misbehaving today. He beat up another kid. Oy vey, no ma. It cannot be. I know my son. Look at the other boy. Do you know what a punch he gave him? The other boy started. How do you know? You don't know, but it's your son, you bribe. You have to 
be very objective and raise yourself to a very high level that the truth will be above what's good for you. And that's only real Talmidei Chachamim can reach this level. Most people, they support regardless of the truth. There is two rabbis. You Ashkenazi, one of the rabbis Faradi, one Ashkenazi. Immediately you want the Ashkenazi. Why? He's one of us. Same thing Sfaradi. I want him. Why? He's one of us. But maybe the Sfaradi is much higher than the Ashkenazi in Torah. Will teach you so much more or the other way around. This, they, can, they don't care so much. They first care what's in it for me. But the truth has to be above all this calculation. And that's one of the things that the Torah always scream about. The truth always overcome everything else. Doesn't matter. Rambam writes in Ilchot uh, Shuva, chapter 10, al Bet. Person should do everything he can to keep the mitzvot for the sake of heaven. Not for personal gain. Or not because he's afraid of the punishment. Or because of the fear. Or because of losing Olam Abba. Why? Because I love Hashem and I want to do it out of love. Not for the reward and not to gain Olam Abba. And always say the truth. And in the end, the truth will always prevail. You will get also your reward. Don't worry about it. Don't do for the reward, but the reward must come. You win, the truth will always win in the end. We have to live by this. This is the alphabet. Before we finish, Rabotai, and I give some time for questions, I want to just conclude the whole picture. It's very, very important to fix the midot. You got to get rid of your jealousy, you have to get rid of your anger, you have to get rid of your, of your pride, of your stinginess, of your laziness, of your selfishness of your ungratefulness, of your lack of modesty, you're not an honest person, that's also a bad midah, it's called nachluli, nachluli, that's the word. Nochel, nachluli. You have to eliminate all the negative, but it's not easy. The only way to do it is with massive amount of learning Torah every day. Only the Torah will enlighten your eyes to see how much Hashem hates proud people and how much He hates ungrateful people and how much He's disappointed when you're lazy at 10 o'clock, you're still in bed and how much He's disappointed from your ungratefulness. Once you understand that, and you can only understand it by learning a lot of cases in the Torah, that legendary people lost their Olam Abba because of one bad trait. Like Achitofel, Doeg Edomi. There are people who knew the whole Torah, but they had bad traits. Pride, selfishness, jealousy. For that, the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin say that they have no share to the world to come. They learned their entire Torah, Yerovam ben Nevat. Nobody knew Torah like him. He has no share to the world to come. Take all the rabbis in the world today, combine, put them on a scale, and put this Yerovam ben Nevat on the other side. He's greater than all of them. And he has no share to the world to come. Why? He was jealous and full of pride. Two things. And also, Mediach Lavodah Zara. But the main thing, what destroys him is his ego. Hashem told him, you, you know so much Torah, I hate to send someone like you to Gehenom, to hell. Repent that you and me and King David should be together in heaven. And he asked, who's going to be greater, him or me? Me, Barosh. He said, him. Not interested. What is it like? Two neighbors hate each other. Eliyahu and Avi came to one of them. How are you, Reuven? Shalom Alecha El. Who are you? Eliyahu Anavi. Ma? Eliyahu Anavi came to me, Elisha? Wow, what an honor. What can I do for you, Rabbi Eliyahu? 
<laughs> Today it's your lucky day. Anything you ask for me, I will prevail. And one condition. Whatever you want, I'm giving your neighbor that you don't like so much, double. So now he's thinking, I ask a million dollars, he'll give my enemy two million? I'd rather die than see such a thing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask a car, he's going to give him two. I cannot live with that. I'm going to ask to be the smartest in the world, he's going to be double smart. I can live with that. You know what, I have an idea. Poke one of my two eyes. <laughs> like this, you give him double. <laughs> Do you understand? I want to ask you a question. Did you, who, who here grew up in Israel? Anyone here grew up in Israel? Yes, few. So they can, they can approve what I tell you. I say it with sadness, but it's unfortunately reality. I don't know if they still do it today, but when I was a child, that was a common thing. Most people could not afford a car 40 years ago. Most people took buses. Once in a while, taxi. Moniot Sherut, not special. Sherut, standing for an hour until there's six people coming, filling up the taxi, and you drive. Why? Nobody can afford to take a taxi on his own. So it's like service, like buses. If somebody made it and he buys a new car, a day or two later, what happened? Huh? Somebody comes with a key and scratch the door. 10,000 shekel damage. Either have to replace the door or fix it, paint it. Why would a person see a brand new car in the neighborhood and do such a horrible thing? I want to have a car. Why should you have? What do you think about that? Jealousy is so bad. Jealous with someone else, it's stupid. Why? Because everyone Hashem designed his own test in life. Sometimes people run to me to cry that they lost all their money in one shot. That's very bad. To lose a little here and there, okay, you can live with the pain. But let's say you work 20 years, you save 10 million dollars, and boom! In one week! You lost everything. Made off. You just turned the news on. The FBI arrested Bernie Madoff. Ma! All my money is by him. It happens to thousands of people. All their life saving got wiped out in a minute. Sixty billion dollars went down the drain. Bernie Madoff. How much? Yeah. So a lot of people lost. By him, they got wiped out. When a person comes to me to cry that he lost all his money, he never forget, he never remembers that Hashem first gave him 10 million to take it from him. But most people never got even percent of it. That part he forgot. But I want to ask you a question. What's easier to always be drain with no saving or to go up, 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 live in a very high lifestyle and in one crash lose everything. That you can't pay your car leases, you can't pay the house, you can't pay the gardener, the maids, the, the babysitter that lives by you, the electric bill, because you have a mansion. To, to maintain such a house, you need 10,000 minimum a month even before the mortgage for all the workers. And now in one minute, an Avrech in a Kolel has more money in his bank account than you. He froze all your assets. Like they did to this guy, Roman Abramovich. You heard about him? Roman Abramovich? He begged for two weeks to all his friends for one million dollar loan that he can pay the workers. Now one of his billionaire friends agreed to lend him a, a million dollars. Because the, the United States froze all his assets in England. Because he's a friend of Putin. 
Since when, if you're a friend of a murderer, let's say, that they're allowed to freeze your money, I never understood the point here. Why are you punishing me for him? Just because I'm his friend? No, we want to put pressure on him. This is what we do to all his friends, like he cares. I'm sure Putin did not sleep a week at night because of Roman Abramovich. You know? Anyway, he got the point. So when the person never had, he always struggled. If a person that went up, 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 and then in one minute he crashed, who suffers more? Both of them have zero balance right now. But one was very rich and went back to zero. Who suffers more? The rich one suffered a thousand times worse than the one who always was poor. Where does it say it? In the Gemara. The Gemara say, and we finish here, the Gemara say, who you have to give more tzedakah? To a poor or to someone that was rich? Someone that was rich. Even if he had a horse, meaning a BMW today, horse, because the people had either a donkey or nothing. Horse it was already a fancy car. <laughs> so even if he had a horse to run for him, you have to get him a horse. If he was eating on China dishes, you have to get him China dishes. It sounds a little bit strange, no? I have to give him a horse? If, if a rich man lost all his money, he needs food now, no? Okay, don't worry, we'll take care of your food. Every week we'll send you a few boxes, you and your children can still eat. I have to get you now a new BMW? If you tell it to someone who would agree to donate, what are you collecting for? Moshe lost all his money in the stock market, we buying him a BMW instead of the one the police repossessed. <laughs> we buy him a new BMW. It's the BMW buy to your mother, not to him. Get out of here. Right or wrong? But that's what the Gemara say. Let's see who's clever here. Why the Chachamim cared so much that you're gonna get the rich person the same lifestyle he used to have? What do we learn from that, psychologically? That poverty is not equal by two individuals. Someone that was always poor does not suffer mentally so much. A little bit. Someone that was very rich and lost all his wealth, his heart and mind are destroyed. It's pikuach nefesh. It's a life risk. He can have a nervous breakdown, panic attack, depression, suicidal. So many bad things can come out of it. How many rich people like this kill themselves? So the Gemara is not talking about the money here. They talk about the psychology behind it. The idea here is to save someone's life, bring him back on his, on his legs. Mentally, now that we not worry about the money here, mentally. We have a saying in the Torah, Hashem Natan, Hashem Lakach, Yishem Hashem Evorach. Hashem gave, Hashem took, the name of Hashem should be blessed. Many children are dying now in terror attacks, as you can see. People stand in a bus stop, they come, they kill them. Two little kids, four and two, a whole country was shocked, such angels. And everybody asked, how does Hashem do such a thing? When Hashem punish wicked people, there's not that many questions. But when Hashem punish pure righteous kids from Talmud Torah, millions of questions rising. Who doesn't have questions on Hashem when he see innocent, righteous kids dying? Raise his hand. Anyone here doesn't have even a little bit bad feeling towards Hashem when he see these children getting killed from Arabs? Be honest. Anyone saw these two kids dying and they didn't ask Hashem, what are you doing? How can you do this to us? Who did not think like this? 
ברוך השם אברוע נזען אסתיר. But I want to tell you something. Mentally it's very hard. Of course the questions are coming. The questions are coming because we are operating by our, our feelings and not by our knowledge and head. If we would adopt what we learn in the Torah, we would never have a question about it. The opposite. That's the way it should have been. What do you mean? Tell you how it works. When there is a bad decree against the Jewish nation, 10,000 people have to die. 10,000 Mechalele Shabbat has to die. The Satan is the prosecutor. He comes to the court of heaven, dear judge, dear God, I am not getting out of the courtroom until 10,000 Mechalele Shabbat in Tel Aviv would drop dead. Hashem doesn't want to kill 10,000 of his children, even though they go against him every day and they hate the Torah and religion, but he wants them to live longer than they should maybe repent. So instead of taking 10,000 wicked people, Hashem take two, three, five righteous people instead. Because the way Hashem evaluates people is not by how much money they have or what kind of a job they have, no only by how much they wait spiritually. Since young kids before Bar Mitzvah don't have any sins, they're very high level souls, and they learn Torah in, a, in the highest level because learning Torah without sins is a lot higher than learning Torah with sins, the Gemara says. So when Hashem take two, two kids that learn in Talmud Torah, or five or ten, or very religious Talmidei Chachamim that get killed coming out of a synagogue or something like that, every one of them can be equal to a few thousand people. That's a sacrifice for the entire nation. Killing five instead of 20,000. On a scale. That's okay. Now we got the concept. But why the five has to pay for the wicked people who hates them? The 10,000 10, people that should have died hate the five religious people that just died for them. They don't appreciate it. Some of them are even happy that they died. Look at the comments that they write. Less Haredim, better world, they write. So the question is, why would, why would these innocent, righteous people have to die for these 10,000 10, wicked people? The answer is, they don't lose from it. They get full compensation from Hashem. Don't worry. Nobody ever lost from doing Hashem's will. If Hashem wanted you to die young to save the life of 10,000 people, you're going to get a reward that you save not one person, 10,000 people. A huge reward in the next world. In my death, I gave 10,000 wicked people extension to live another 30, 40 years. And maybe 200 of them became Baalet Shuvah after all. I'm going to cash on their mitzvot for eternity. Why did they do Shuvah? Because I died instead of them. Where does it say it in the Torah? Who can give me the source? Shira Shirim. Dodi Yarad Leganov. Lilkot Shoshanim. Dodi is a Kadosh Baruch Hu went down to the garden, to this world, to pick up the roses. Tzadik is the rose. The wicked people are the thorns and the weeds. So from million weeds and, so, and, and, and thorns, here all of a sudden one rose. That's the righteous person. Smells good, looks good, influence the environment. Hashem picks him up. And all the other thorns continue to survive. And that's the secret of Kol Israel Arevim Zelazeh. Now one person can die for the sins of others. He will not lose. In the next world he's very proud of it. Don't worry about it. None of them would say to Hashem, hey, it's not fair, why you took me? I have to die for them? Because in the next world everything is clear. And you already know your reward and you're very happy and you're not worried. I want to give some time for questions. If you have anything about anything I spoke, 
or even what I didn't speak about, now it's the time. I have a few books over here, left, now I couldn't carry that much on the suitcases after the lecture, if anyone wants a dedication, I'll write for you. But I want any questions about what we spoke. Yes. Of, of course, because a mother like this that lost two kids and she does Kiddush Hashem and she suffered because the life of 10,000 people got saved thanks to her children, of course she's going to get the reward for all the suffering she had to go through. One of the best ways to gain reward from Hashem is suffering. Remember, there's no way besides learning Torah, no productive way to get a promotion and, and progress in the next world like suffering. I once told the story that one guy saw a, a Jew, one Cossack saw a Jew in Russia in the forest and started to hit him with a stick and the king and his soldiers just showed up. And the king said to the soldier, arrest him, why is he beating him up? So what do you care, he's a Jew. Oh, he's a Jew? He also an anti-Semite? Take him to a trial. The Jew is all broken, they picked him up, they put him by the doctors uh, of the king. After a week that the Jew has the cast and he was able to stand on his legs, the king is making a trial to the guy that was beating up the Jew. And he asked him, how many times you hit him? He was afraid maybe the king was there all alone. He was afraid to lie. So he said approximately a hundred times. So he said, for every time you hit the Jew, you have to give him a thousand ruble. A hundred thousand ruble. And you have until tomorrow morning to get him the money. If not, I will hang you here. Ah, oh, the guy is having a big problem now. Once the guy went and he has until tomorrow to come up with the money, the Jew began to cry. The Jew is crying. Oh, what happened? The king asked him, I'm not a fair judge. No, you're a great judge. I'm not crying about you. I'm crying about myself, how stupid I was. If I knew for every shot he gives me, I make a thousand rubles, I would not resist. Do you know half of the shots I, I, I prevented? But if I knew that this suffering pays me so much, I would say, faster, you fool. What is this? Only one shot a minute. Give me five every shot. Get another stick with two hands. We are laughing, but we, it's all us. When we have a little suffering, oh, not again, I can't take this. How much? Enough, I can't. That's because we read, read, read. We understand the logic, but we don't have a muna. Then we begin to complain. More questions? Yes? Uh, two questions and one. Uh, number one is how do we understand that certain big tzaddikim lived their whole life with chesed, like Rebbe Kaddish, and then there were certain big tzaddikim, I think it was Rabbi, who was very wealthy. So well, how, how does that work out with, the, with that whole concept of... Rebbe was very wealthy, but before he passed, he raised his ten fingers and said, Hashem is my witness, I never enjoyed this uh, material world. So what happened to all his wealth? He gave it all out to people. That's what I said before. Sometimes the person... All the tzaddikim in the Talmud that were wealthy, they used their money to do good things with them. I wish all the, the rich people today would do 1% of what they used to do. Even Rabbi Tarfon was a wealthy man. One time Rabbi Akiva told him there is a great field. He was doing real estate. I will buy you that field. Rabbi Tarfon gave him the money and forgot about it because there was so much into the learning. One time they passed by and Rabbi Tarfon asked him, hey, by the way, I once gave you a lot of money to buy a field. Where is that field? It should have been here, no? He said, come, let me show you your field. He took him to a place that he made a yeshiva. Everyone sits and learns Torah. He said, this is what I did with your money. He kissed him on his hand. You should be blessed. Why? Why do I need a field? Torah is a million times better than any field. 
The, the way that people used to think, the Chachamim, completely different than today. Why one person is rich, the other one is not? That's only Hashem knows all the reincarnations, the Gilgulim, past life, present life, future life, what's his real purpose in life. Not everyone has to be rich. Some people have to be receivers. Some people have to be givers. The world has to be in such a way that there will be receivers and there will be givers. And then in the next life, it can turn around. You used to be a receiver, now you are a giver, or the other way around. But that's only Hashem knows how to calculate it. Also, how do we understand the whole, like, okay, suffering, the more suffering, the more suffering, how do we understand that? Like, you talk about Rekiva, that you How do we understand the suffering? I tell you how. Suffering, suffering, take away the crave to uh, materialism. I'll give you an example. If now you go to a very fancy restaurant with a rich man, the steak over there is $300. You and him, it's going to be over $1,000, the bill. Dinner. But once you sit down with the, you're about to eat the steak, you get a phone call from your stockbroker that your stock just crashed and you just lost $300,000 in a minute. Can you enjoy the steak? You don't want to even taste. What happened? I lost my appetite. Suffering, when it comes to physical suffering, brings down the ego, the proud mentality, the addiction to materialism, and makes you a much better person and much more righteous. So suffering also is a magnet to Hashem. Because when we suffer, who we scream to? To our grandmother? Who are we going to scream to? We scream to Hashem. When a person is sick, he screams to Hashem. When he lost someone, he screams to Hashem. When he's about to lose, he screams to Hashem. When he gets arrested in a, in a jail alone, even the biggest chiloni, believe me, he screams to Hashem. Oh, so I tell you what, the Gemara say, the Chachamim say, Lo em velo scharam. Even though uh, suffering is a great clean out and it takes away all our sins, we rather get it with learning Torah, not through suffering. The suffering should go to learning Torah. We don't want to be sick, we don't want to have pain, we don't want to lose children, we don't want uh, you know, all kinds of other problems, suffering from the goyim, from the kingdom. We rather suffer by giving our life to Torah and mitzvot. But Hashem decide how he wants a person to get clean. Sometimes it's really through Torah. Sometimes he has no other way. A person has to suffer physically. And suffering made a lot of non-religious people become religious. It's one of the best tools to wake up a person. You know, I know one uh, person was making a lot of money. A lot of money. Young. Young, very young, not even married. May already got to make a hundred thousand dollars a month. And what happened? He had a big fight with his boss or something, whatever happened, and he fired him. And you had to see from the minute it happened how religious that person became. It was not religious. No Shomer Shabbat, eating, no Birkat Amazon, no Brachot, Pitom, Mevarech, Pitom Birkat Amazon. Pitom Daveni, where is my tefillin? Something like this would never happen to that guy unless Hashem gave him such a punch right to the stomach and woke him up. If Hashem wouldn't do it, he would continue to make millions and become a tycoon and then for sure he would not look towards the religion. Sometimes Hashem's ways to wake up a person is to do something extreme. I want you to know also one more thing. From all the speakers in the world, do you know who make the most amount of Baalei Tshuva? Those who they call controversial, extremist, fanatic, vile. You know, they have words, the Americans. Uh, you know, all kinds of words they have. Those are the only ones, basically, that make massive amount of people become religious. All the politically correct, soft approach, I promise you, don't make one bad shuvah here. Nothing. 
continue to grind water. In Israel we have a say, tochani mine. Grinding water. Why? Because nobody leaves the lecture with, with, with fear. Nobody wakes up and says, wow, I'm so wicked. I never knew Hashem is so upset at me. But when it comes to a lecture and hear what is really mean to be gay or to be mechalel Shabbat or to be a thief or to have horrible midot, he goes home, he cannot sleep three nights. Because he begins to think, what's going to be my end? If I don't wake up and don't start to make a drastic change in my lifestyle, I'm going to be one of these people that the Torah buried. I don't want that to happen to me. And he wakes up. Telling a wicked person, you tzaddik, Hashem loves you, you have nothing to worry about, drown him even more. He become too confident. Oh, Hashem loves me. So why should I even change? I started to explain that today we have a pandemic with the non-Jewish girls. They meet a pretty Goya and right away they want to bring her to convert. But I want to tell you from 27 years experience with converts and 27 years dealing with public in general that many of these conversions is the destruction of the life of this Israeli or this Jew. Whether it's Bukharian, Persian, Syrian or Ashkenazi, it doesn't matter. Usually you know how it ends. Very, very rarely the Goya will remain religious for the rest of her life. Very rarely. Most of the time she's excited in the beginning until he begins to put her down. People don't know how to behave to women today. So they hurt them mentally and emotionally. And women are different than men. Hashem designed them that they act from their hearts. It's all about feelings. Once a woman's heart is awakened, the brain frees. She cannot make the brain overcome her heart. A man has to work a little hard to convince himself to go against his heart because he, he knows what's the right thing to do. As painful as it is, but by women it doesn't exist. Once a woman's heart is broken and she has mercy on someone, she's going to follow the heart. Even knowing that later on she's going to pay a bigger price. This is the way Hashem made the women. So by women, if her man, which is her whole world, is putting her down, abusing her, verbally, mentally, physically, whatever the case is, what do you think her reaction is? She kicked the religion because she's not happy, she's destroyed inside, she's desperate, she has no reason to live, and what is she doing? She's not happy. When you're not happy, you cannot keep the mitzvot. And you see thousands of very religious women, kisui rosh, fanatic, teilim all day. As soon as their husband destroyed them, and they got a get and they, and they got divorced, they leave the religion, they meet a goy, and they go to Mexico. And they leave the religious kids. She doesn't want to hear about anyone. Nobody even knows where she is. How can it be? She was 20 years fanatic. She was the center of the community. Because by women, it doesn't go by what she knows. It's what she feels. And now this Goya, she's now excited. Her guy makes her Jewish. She didn't want it, but she wanted him, so she converted for him. It's called Giyur L'Shem Ishut. As long as he's nice to her, she won't care to be religious. Once he will begin to do horrible things to her, like most men do, what do you think is going to happen? At one point she's going to get up and leave. She doesn't care about get. She's going to find a boyfriend. She's going to do whatever, and she's a shetish. And if they have already kids, after he divorced this Goya that supposedly converted, she's going to meet another Goy and live with him and his religious kids from yeshiva will have to be every other Shabbat with her and the Goy. And I've seen it hundreds of times happening. Everything I just described to you. People think taking a pretty Goya and bringing her to the bed din and converting her Will, be, will solve the problem, they're just the beginning of their problems. Their life is about to destroy it big time. 
It happened to David Amelech. It won't happen to us. David Amelech, the legend, the holiest person on earth, made that mistake that destroyed his life. How much he suffered from Avshalom, from his other kids. And, and today, the level of the Goyot in the time of David Amelech and the level of the Goyot today, there's really nothing to compare. So back then, women were more modest in general. It wasn't so far. The kind of women today that they meet in the clubs, in a bar, you know how many, girl, how many guys they already w went with? Why do you think that this Bukharian macho is going to last with her forever? You know how, what a history she has? <coughs> Plus, a lot of them are mentally hurt in their mind. Either she comes from an ugly divorce, some guy abused her, she finally found a nice guy going to the shul, so she lives in some kind of a dream. But this dream is about to explode in her face and more in his face. Chaval, a lot of people that already became religious, they can control their desire. The urge to find a pretty girl overcome all the common sense. Once they receive the bribe from her, they can never see the truth. They're going to give you 50 reasons why she's better than any Jewish girl they dated. She doesn't ask for a house in Beverly Hills. She doesn't want a fancy car. She's willing to do anything for me. Put me in a basement. I will do everything for you. I learn to cook for you. Whatever you want. I don't, ever, I don't even want diamond. Get me a cubic zirconia. You know, every Jewish girl I met, she wants a house on the Miami on the water, and she wants this, and she wants that. What? She's great. She took care of me. I was this. She helped me. They'll find 500 reasons. But the reasons are all because they are bribed. They're afraid to lose their benefits. So their mind automatically protects the will. That's what the Rambam say. The Rambam asks, who is a servant of who? The brain, asechel, ushamash la ratzon, or a ratzon ushamash la sechel. Who serves who? Your will and desire serve your brain, or your brain is a servant of your will and your desires? What do you think? Who is a servant of who in life? Your will and your desire is serving your brain, or your brain is serving your will? The Gemara answered this question. The Gemara said the Jewish nation did not dance around the golden calf because they believed that's God. The reason they did it is to allow them to go and have forbidden relationship with the non-Jewish pretty girls with the goyot. What's the connection? I'll tell you what's the connection. If a person look like a chassid, black a... If a person dress like a rabbi, black hat, beard, tzitziot, black suit, he cannot go and have a relationship with the goya. It's a big chilul Hashem. He's going to be embarrassed of himself. <laughs> Everyone looks at him. The only way he can do it is first he remove his beard, get rid of his hat, make his tiny, his yamaka small like Bennett. You know Bennett? <laughs> Bennett, he has this yamaka, this size. He glue it with crazy glue on his bald spot. You know? So after his yamaka become like this, and you know, the rest of his outfit change, he has all of a sudden pink shirt with some flowers, you know? So once he already looked like that, it's much easier for him consciously, his conscious, to go and make the scene. After they dance around that, this is God, not him. The God that gave us the Torah is no longer with us. This is our God. It's much easier to go to the Goyot after that. What do you want from me? I'm not religious. Same thing over here. Once the desire wants something and a person is like an addict, the brain immediately begin to give all the excuses why it's right. After he desire this pretty goya, 
I'm getting her no matter what. The brain immediately begins. No problem, Moshe. The goyot are ma much more down to earth. They devoted. Uh, a lot of them became very big righteous. The grandmother of David Amelech, she's Ruta Moavia. Maybe the Mashiach will come out of you. You know, oh, you know, she's such a good person. It's Kiddush Hashem. Don't Hashem wants the Jews to convert the whole world to Judaism. That's what the Gemara say. You are a big tzaddik that you bring this German girl to the community. But that's how it goes. You first have the desire. Now the brain is the lawyer. That's what the Rambam say. You know, there was a guy in Israel, Tzioini. He's in the army, fighter. The Kippot Srugot, the Datim Lumim, they're big fighters. The army is a big thing in their life. All of them are generals. They're smart people. They learn Torah. They have values. And they're very much Zionim, meaning the state of Israel for them is the second God. So this guy met a German volunteer in the kibbutz there, you know. She comes to pick up oranges. They bring some goyim from Europe. A lot of them are pretty girls. They go around with the, with the Israeli guys. And what happened after that? He fell in love with her. She's a goya from Germany. After a while, he decided to marry her. And here's a Yamaka on his head. Marry the goya. And she refused to convert. No conversion. Where is he going to get married? In a church in Berlin on a Sunday. With 500 guests. She has a high society family. His friends from the army, some of them religious. What's happened to you, Itzik? You're out of your mind. What's going, what's going on with you? You're religious. You come to shul. You put fill in. How are you going to do such a thing? I can't. I can't. My heart. I fell in love with her. I can't live without her. I, don't preach to me. I know the truth. I know it's wrong. There's nothing I can do about it. Understand me. <laughs> His friends, no, no matter what they did, they couldn't do anything. So they say, you know what? What are we going to do? They say to him, okay, it's sick. I know tonight you have the flight this afternoon to Germany. We, we got you a goodbye gift. Please pass by our house. We'll give it to you and we'll pray for you that you will succeed. He came to the apartment. He's happy. His three friends are accepting his, you know, his, his choice. They told him, come, we got you the gift. It's in a room. They took him to the room, pushed him into the room and locked the door. And you know, in Israel, all the windows have bars and it's the third floor anyway. He cannot get out. You have Tfilin in a closet. You have tuna cans, you have food, you have bread, you have bathroom, you have everything you need. We're not getting you out until tomorrow. No, come on, don't do it. I have a flight in two hours. They're waiting for me. I have a big wedding. They spend tons of money. Don't do this. How can we let our brother destroy his soul? We died for each other in a war. You want us to let you go and marry a German, a granddaughter of a Nazi? Don't do this. Open the door. I'll sue you. I'll kill you. All night he banged. Open the door on our dead body. After the wedding supposedly finished, the next morning they opened the door. Big fight. He is a gorilla, but there are three. Three fighters against one. Boom, bam, boom. Put him on the floor. Stock. Immediately he called Christina. That's a true story. It happened. Christina! <laughs> I'm so sorry! Ma! You dirty Jew! We had to see what mouth she opened. Hitler should have finished the job! Everyone warned me from you! You destroyed my life! If I could kill you, I'd kill you myself! And all the time he was telling them, no, she's not a Nazi, she's not anti-Semite. She came to Israel. After the five minutes that she was cursing him and all the Jews, he hung up the phone, he looks at them. I cannot believe how stupid I can be. <laughs> I was about to marry this Nazi woman. How, how it would end? Maybe he would put poison in my drink tomorrow. 
That's what happened when you receive bribe. When he was intimate with her, he forgot about Hashem, forgot about the truth, forgot about the future. Why? Because it's like a drug addict. He needs the drugs today. And if you don't give it to him, he's going to steal, he's going to do horrible things. Once he's relaxed with his drugs, talk to him about whatever you want. It's okay. Once the curve arrives, that's it. There's nobody to talk to. And that's what happened to a lot of these Jews. They go to places they're not supposed to. They don't watch their eyes. They meet girls online. They do whatever they do. And then their life is destroyed in this world and in the next world. Not only in this world, in the next world as well. They say, I don't know if it's true, that Hitler himself came to the world for intermarriage between a Jew and a non-Jew. There are documents that support it. I don't know how authentic they are. But just imagine if it's true that one person brought to the world a person that killed 50 million people. A third of the Jewish nation he killed. And he's now in, in the court of heaven, has to be judged for his forbidden relationship to this woman. And look what happened to his nation because of it. Look what happened to Shimshon and Delilah. Shimshon, he destroyed himself. Some of the Chachamim say he lost his Olam Abba. Prophet, holy from birth. Fell in love with his Goya, made him blind, made him a prisoner, tortured him, betrayed him. Until he killed the Philistines together with him and died with them. Tamut nafshim plishtim. Tamut nafshi, some of the Chachamim say, where the plishtim goes to hell, and don't have Olam Abba, that's where he went. Chas v'shalom. God forbid. Shim Shona. Kadosh mi beten. Before he was born, Hashem said to his mother, don't drink wine. That's going to be a Nazir, a special holy kid. Fell in love with the Goya. It was the destruction of his life.